Hello. Welcome to another episode of Ancient Office Hours by the Ozymandias Project. Trireme Transit is now boarding for all new and returning passengers. Now departing, present ponderings. Next stop is Ancient Office Hours at a library lost in the sands of time. Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's special release episode featuring the lovely Maya Dean, author of the newly released Wrath Goddess Sing. Maya is a novelist, visual artist, and avid student of all the arts of civilization attributed to Inanna by the first known writer, Enhedwana. She is a graduate of the Rutgers Camden MFA in creative writing and is currently a professor at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. I was excited to ask Maya about how she discovered her love of mythology, about the revolutionary nature of her debut novel, the myths and stories that inspire her, and how to support trans reception of classics. I hope you enjoy this episode, and if you like what you hear, please give us a five-star rating and review us on Apple or Spotify. You can also subscribe to our Patreon, as this will allow us to reach more people and make more exciting ancient world content. Enjoy! Great. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really, really excited to like dig into everything. But uh, first thing is, you know, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got into like loving like ancient mythology? Um, Sure. I'm Maya Dean and I'm the author of the forthcoming Wrath Goddess Sting. Um, Honestly, I got started really young. So when I was very, very small, my father would read me Dr. Seuss, but I, I hit the point when I was about six years old where I was like, no, I need something serious. I need something for adults. And he took me in my word, which is insane, but he's a linguist. So the Iliad became my bedtime reading at the age of six. He didn't skip any lines either. So it was like, oh, you know, a spear enters through so-and-so's kidney. It's like, okay. Naturally, I loved it. Of course, solid. I was amazed. I was like, wow, cool. Athena, relatable, so Mm -hmm. relatable. Then I was like, Achilles constantly has to be kept out of trouble by Athena. Hmm. Okay. Achilles is interesting. And then of course I became obsessed with Diomedes like you do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with the Seuss because Athena likes him. So that's a good recommendation, right? (laughs) Exactly. And that sort of, that was where I got started. I mean, I would say it was, it was, it's also one of those things where the more you look, especially at the texts and the less you're getting things secondhand from like Edith Hamilton and so on, the weirder it gets and the more internally inconsistent. Like I've managed to catch some flack from people who maybe don't understand, for instance, that Iliad Agamemnon didn't kill his daughter. It would be kind of messed up for him to be like, would you like to marry a Fianasa if he had killed her? 10 years before that would be real weird that's more of an Athenian drama thing and so yeah just the more I looked into everything the more I was like this doesn't add up and that's great there is no single version of these stories there's just a strange shifting constellation of canon nice yeah start them when they're young I don't know if I was (laughs) that young no I definitely wasn't six but I mean my head was all up in the clouds too so I was definitely like no you know this like um, mythology thing. It's really cool. But, um, I think, I think, well, I mean, I grew up with like Harry Potter and and other stuff. So, um, I kind of just listened to what was read to me, but yeah, no, no. Um, I love how everyone has their like awakening and they're like, wait, and then you'd like discovered all this stuff. And then, you know, that first time that you ever hear something, you're just like, simultaneously kind of horrified because you're like wait what but you're also just like but it's so cool uh oh man sometimes I think I'd I'd pay for the experience of just experiencing it for the first time all over again um Uh just because I was I was so young that I don't think I appreciated it as much as I did but mm, that's debatable so if you got started really young though um you know did you ever consider maybe wanting to major in classics or at you know when you were growing up was that just like not something that was talked about and so you just like didn't know it was you know a thing you could go to school for so I took the opportunity when I was when I was young to try to learn Latin and then to try to learn Greek in college and you know I got to the point where I can 
I can pronounce the words. My vocabulary isn't completely hopeless. I can sort of parse things out if you give me nice. time. But like, I don't know, an actual career in classics is a very particular thing. And I was, I was never really in the position to do that. That's too bad. I mean, I know so many people who, you know, also, and they were like, oh, that seems cool. But uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, I need to uh, go to school, you know, and uh, do something that will uh, allow me to come out of school with, with, a, with a decent job is kind of, you know. Yeah, pretty much. Although in this case, a decent job is a writing teacher. So I don't know. It's all relative, right? You know, but hey, it's, it's fun. So, I mean, you know, did you always have a knack for writing? Like, was that kind of like something you would do when you were young, like a nice outlet or, you know, were you just like, hey, I think it would be fun to try to actually go into this, uh, you know, professionally? When I was eight, I was like, I have a great idea. I'm going to read the Iliad. And then of course it was like two pages long and it was completely nonsensical, but maybe that was just a thing I sort of settled on because that never really left the back of my head. What did happen as I became, I guess, more aware of everything is that certain aspects of the stories really started sticking with me. I did end up going to graduate school for an MFA. So my formal training is in writing fiction, but I think it must have been the mid 2010s before I realized, oh, I started having these sort of strange visions of this conversation between Achilles and Aphrodite, but it was very much what would they talk about if this wasn't the Achilles we were used to, if this was a completely different take on Achilles, one that answered the what is Achilles name among the maidens riddle with a very different answer or the same answer that's been circulating for 2000 years, but taken seriously. Nice. Then at some point I read Statius, who's awful. And the Achilliad really upset me. I was just like, oh, okay, well, gosh, we have like, you know, 2100 year old transphobia, cool. That's very Roman of you. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> Oof, yowch. And so then I had to, I had to pursue this particular book, uh, which is good because I don't know, nothing ever, there's sort of a thing in that they teach you as a cliche in writing workshops, like write what you know, and sounds like write autobiographical fiction about, I don't know, being a trans adjunct professor in the 2010s or something, but like, no, sometimes it means write a really seriously bronze age version of, uh, of the life of Achilles, sort of peel away the Homer to see what, what the pre-collapse world that Achilles' life was set in would have been like, you know, drawing on archaeology. For sure. I mean, that sounds really cool. And, you know, I did want to get into, you know, what did inspire you, you know, to not only write about Achilles, but right from the unique, you know, point of view, because there's a lot of, there's, you know, you can find so many different books about Achilles, but, um, you know, I think it's super awesome. And it's so, it's so bold to reimagine Achilles, you know, as a trans woman. It's, it's, it's just like, it blew my mind. So when I heard about the book, I was just like, what, you know, it's not often that I come across something that I was like, you know, I never would have heard, you know, thought to do just cause I was, Mm -hmm. coming up, you know, with a classics background, you know, it, it's kind of, unfortunately, it's, it's quite one dimensional in how, you know, we're taught the source material because they say, no, 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 just, just, you know, like, yes, you can interpret it on your own, but they're like, oh, but, but stay behind the, the, the contours, the bounds of like, you know, what it mm -hmm. is, you know, what it's presented and to be able to, I mean, I can't even imagine the freedom you had and just being able to be like, all right, I'm just going to do this thing. So like, you know, what, what prompted you to just be like, I'm just going to take it this way. Well, one of the things that I realized was that what we consider to be the contours of the classics is a much narrower thing than what people in ancient Greece considered to be the contours of what you could do with the classics. Yeah, so I'm not the biggest fan of Athenian drama. I've read all the classics, but like, yeah. But one day Aeschylus was like, you know what? There's like a minor sort of fanfic variant where Agamemnon kind of butchers his oldest daughter. And I know that this isn't really, it doesn't really fit into the Iliad. I know, cause she's like alive and all, 
but it's such a good story. Mm -hmm. And Best Girls just did that. And then it became canonical to the extent that if you question it, people get upset. And if you point out that she's discussed as though alive in the Iliad, well, it kind of breaks people's brains a bit. Mm -hmm. It's all this messy fandom. Aphrodite got retconned. Aphrodite Urania to Aphrodite Pandemos. She starts out as this like very Adana style ancient Near Eastern sky goddess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she gets retconned into Zeus's daughter and from like this sky goddess of battle and death with kind of Uranus's portfolio into the Aphrodite we uh, know from so many classical era myths who's really been tamed in a lot of ways. Mm. Mm -hmm. and like has a mother and doesn't arise out of like I don't know some sort of violent castration episode (laughs) like there's so much that just does not add up and doesn't have to that when I realized the sort of history of ideas of really the 18th and 19th century European specifically western imperial European um construction of the Iliad as kind of this uh this masterwork of the fount of Western literature to be really the justification for this Western civ idea they were constructing. That gave me a lot of freedom to say no. Nice. (laughs) And the more I looked into it, the more I was like, oh, but also there were just all these readings that were only really suppressed in the 19th and 20th century. Like if you look at art representations of Achilles from the classical period to the 18th century, Achilles is portrayed as a woman about a fifth of the time. Louis XIV had a trans sister who commissioned this Achilles on Skiro statue for the gardens at mm-hmm. Versailles. It's a really cool statue, but it's just, you know, it depicts Achilles as this like armed woman because a lot of, like that was kind of the way that that artistic tradition survived. It was like, well, yeah, but it's a great excuse to draw a woman as the most powerful warrior of all time. And so people kept doing it. There must be a need. Um, But in the 19th and 20th century, that and the tradition of having Achilles portrayed as a woman on stage were suppressed. So the more I looked at things, the more I was just like, well, I was not consulted when we decided to delete half the interpretations of Achilles. Why not not do that? That's brilliant. You know, it's bold. Not a, not even just brilliant. It's it's very bold. Uh, I I appreciate it a lot um, because, and and who better to to be the person to do that than a trans woman yourself? Because like you know, I I guess you know in this day and age, the last thing we want are for people whose lived experiences it is not their thing to you know sort of step in and be like, okay, well I'm gonna you know do this thing. So do yeah. you almost like feel a sense of responsibility as being like the first person to really take it in this direction then? Yeah, I think so. But I also I also think that like there's a there's an artistic responsibility whenever you're representing anyone to at least not carelessly fail to understand. Like for instance, obviously I'm not a Bronze Age trans woman, but a lot of research went into at least understanding what that would be like and kind of thinking through how to portray that. And I think that's like that's true for like I don't know. I'm not like a strict own voices person. I think that it's just that if you're going to do something well outside of your experience, you have a responsibility to do it well. And if you can't do that, you have a responsibility to stop and do better. But yeah, I did feel responsibility to Achilles, you know, to my readers, because the way trans women are portrayed is usually extremely narrow. Like generally speaking, there isn't room for a lot of complexity in our portrayals there isn't room for a lot of humanity so often it's well you know you have to embody someone who both simultaneously knows your place and also performs exactly what cis people would expect Mm -hmm. of you and Achilles is just not that kind of figure Achilles is not to get like Nietzschean or something but Achilles is like at least beyond good and evil Mm -hmm. yeah yeah Achilles is like this profoundly messy figure who's also full of love, completely selfish and ridiculously generous at the same time. And I found that so compelling, just the messiness of a life that 
is lived with complete commitment, but isn't necessarily lived to satisfy anyone else's expectations of what that life should look like. Nice. Yeah. Well said. Well said. I mean, it, it, what, a, what an interesting character. I mean, I, I always find that either when I, when I read the Iliad and I, and I, you know, read Achilles or when I see Achilles portrayed, like, yeah, that, that's someone's portrayal. But at the same time, I always think, you know, like, how is it possible for this one person to be simultaneously like the strongest, most powerful person in this world and yet be the most childish, like, in, like, just, just, just like, tempestuous strumpet you know like over in a corner like right. oh you took my 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 present you you took my stuffed animal okay now i'm gonna like go and pout like you know and then you have like the the, the enormous respect and the beloved by the gods and then you have the fact that it's just like if all these people just being like eh, fuck him okay whatever whatever you know it's yeah but that's the fascinating thing to me also because achilles is of all the characters in the iliad the most like the gods mm-hmm it makes sense. I mean, there's, there's an entire, there's that entire thread in classical Iliad criticism where they're kind of trying to come up with like a reason for the Trojan war. And one of the, one of the popular ideas is like, oh, well, Zeus had to kill all the demigods because we couldn't exist in a world full of demigods. Clearly they just had to clean house. There were just too many demigods. And in that version, Achilles is generally considered to be the most threatening of the demigods. Like there's one version where, where Thetis is encouraged strongly by Zeus to marry a mortal because uh, whatever child will be massively greater than the father. And in that version of the story, like it's heavily implied that Zeus had his eye on Thetis and then got this prophecy and was like, oh no, I know how this game goes. And that intrigues me. Just the idea that the gods are scared, that they've been through so many cycles of violence. I mean, this is really evident in Greek mythology. You've got so many machis. Definitely. And then you're also incredibly, incredibly inspired by, you know, ancient uh, Near Eastern culture as well. I mean, we talk about Anana, mm-hmm. you know, and, she, and you know, uh, a lot of people... Uh-huh. Uh, sadly don't know about her or aren't taught about her really unless you you know specifically take a class on you know ancient Mesopotamian art or you know you you just really love their mythology and you go looking for it and Mm -hmm. as someone who my first passion was not Greece it was Egypt it was completely the I I've fallen in love with ancient Egypt and the mystery and the magic so you know how did you deal with like you know, you love all these ancient, you know, Near Eastern things. And then how did you kind of settle into the more classical aspect of it? You know, was it an easy transition or? Well, I would actually say it wasn't a transition at all because to the Bronze Age Greeks, Egypt was the center of the world. Like literally Mycenaean elites painted their houses with scenes of the Nile Delta. And all the latest fashions came from Egypt. Like this was a super cosmopolitan interconnected world. Like the letters that various ancient Near Eastern rulers would write to each other. Like you'd have the king of the Mycenaean Greeks, the Achaeans, like sending letters to Elastia with Cyprus, just like, hey, could you, I'll send you some stuff. Could you, uh, could you send me that cool stuff you got from Egypt? There are these beads, these carnelian beads from the Indus Valley civilization that ended up in Spain and Mycenaean graves and in Korea. Like this is this is a world where the trade networks were so interconnected that like networks of trade that in some places, in some ways might run from Wales to like Southern China, an amazingly cosmopolitan world. This was, it's fascinating to me. And Bronze Age Greeks were incredibly influenced by Egypt. So were the classical Greeks. They tended to credit Egypt with everything, but you know, post, uh, post-Hellenistic post kingdoms, there was a move not to do that so much, except in Egypt, which in Ptolemaic Egypt, where they were happy to take credit, but also it was like a Greek empire in a weird colonial relationship with a colonized Egyptian hinterland. Yeah, this is, this is, something I think about a lot because the artificial separation of these into separate civilizations is in so many ways 
an invention of the past 2000 years and especially an invention of the past 200 years. If you told like, for instance, just a random piece of trivia, Sappho's best friend, Alcaeus, who was like the second best poet <laughs> in archaic Lesbos, his brother was a mercenary commander for the Babylonians. Nice. Supposedly, Socrates, as a teenager, went to Egypt to study, like, you know, like you do. The idea that there was this discrete, separate Hellenistic world is just an invention to make things easier for historians who had a vested interest in compartmentalizing civilizations and cultures. Gotcha. And, and I mean, I guess the, the reason I sort of pivoted, I know it's not the most logical, but that's, I guess, how my brain works. But the, the reason I kind of wanted to ask about that is because, you know, it, it does, I promise, go full circle to kind of this, the discussion about the, the Greek gods that we had. But, you know, looking oh, yeah, at the separation between the cultures that we have artificially built and, but, you know, acknowledging how different these are, what is your interpretation of the differences between the gods. I mean, because it seems like while the uh-huh. Greek ones were very human-like in their qualities, it yeah. seems like, you know, Inanna and all the Egyptian gods, you know, they're they're kind of just, no, no part of them can be like humans because they're so on their own level, you know? And and do you do you see these Mesopotamian gods as kind of not being really on, on that sort of humanistic level? No, I think that that's, in some ways, I think that's an artifact of like the greater amount of Orientalism that is like applied to analysis of gods from Iraq or gods from Egypt. If we look at the stories about Inanna, there's like, there's like a random story where Inanna gets drunk one day, she's lying under a tree, some shepherd comes by and sexually assaults her. She wakes up and she's like, was someone here? And then she hunts him down and kills him. And then she's like, good, all in a good day's work. Off she goes which doesn't necessarily to me feel as much like a cosmic principle as like a pretty narrative of experience or you've got like simultaneously you've got these incredibly like deep ideas about time and stuff like that originated in Egypt like the platonic forms are clearly cribbed from this late period conception of eternity as like the completed life or something like that which is kind of like a it's difficult to describe but it was it's it's like a photon's eye view of reality where like everywhere the photon goes and its entire experience through the light cone becomes like a single eternal moment Mm -hmm. and yet at the same time like the gods who are used to express these concepts there are also stories about them getting massively drunk and deciding to just murder everyone and then all of a sudden another God is like, but actually what if you try having this beer? This beer will settle you down. See, it's red, so you're, 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 you want blood, drink the red beer. Oh, oh, that's that's much better. Okay, okay, I guess I won't destroy humanity. Like there's one story where the underworld has to be created because Ra got mad one day and asked the eye of Ra if she would just kill everyone and then thought better of it and got her really drunk. But a third of everyone was killed at that point. So the underworld has to be created to give the dead people a place to live. Like that's a weirdly human level story. And yet at the same time, you've got the, these amazingly detailed like state sponsored technologies of the afterlife that just become incredibly elaborate and complex and really, really carefully thought out. So I think there's not really a tension between that sort of human level view. I mean, the Greeks did it too. They had abstract conceptions of like the gods as being these higher forces of nature that kind of existed alongside these very human messy gods i kind of think we don't actually have to choose we can we can sort of view things on all those levels at once yeah i mean i wish we didn't have to choose i don't know why we make such a big deal out of it but i do i do interestingly enough take account of like when you do look at the different mythologies from these ancient cultures like certain ones Mm -hmm. just seem outwardly to be way more bonkers than than others you know like (laughs) anyone looking at like norse mythology and then you hear about like yes you know odin is i and you know hangs himself in the tree of knowledge you know like 
you know, on some level, I suppose if you dig into it, you could find some like human motivations, but like on its surface, if you're just like, oh yeah, yeah. He pursued love knowledge so much. He like hung himself on the tree. You know, I'm like, that's like distinctly <laughs> not like a human thing. You know, I love knowledge. I'm a Ravenclaw. I'm not going to go hang myself on this tree being like, I'm going to just, you know, like be wise, you know? And so, you know, it's uh-huh. like, what do you think is really the, you know, the, the attraction, you know, for some people to go to like the bonkers ones versus the people who, cause I know plenty of people who hate North mythology that this just, is not their jam. So they would always go for like ancient Greece. So, you know, is it like a small, is it like maybe just a difference in how we're telling these or is like, do you see some kind of, I mean, yeah, we make these barriers, but like, is there still some kind of difference where like people would be more likely to go gravitate toward one type of mythology than the other? That's an interesting question. And I'm not actually sure. I think so much of it is the framing, like Norse mythology has been framed a particular way and like has been so connected to the idea of Vikings and like, at least in English speaking translations of Norse mythology, so often it's just very like that's the framing, that's the framing device that's used. And all the angles that I try to take to answer that question make things more complicated and weirder because like there's pretty solid archaeological consensus that there was probably a guy named Odin who probably lived somewhere around the three, four, five hundreds CE. So less than 2000 years ago. And at the same time, other gods in that pantheon, Tyr and Thor, pretty clearly they have antecedents that stretch back to like the 2000s BCE. So like 4,000 years. And the more I try to think about it, like part of me is like, well, I mean, what if Odin just was a really weird guy? But at the same time, like, I don't know, it was all cobbled together and then So much of our perceptions of that mythology really come from the last 50, 60 years of retelling. I don't know. In a lot of ways, a lot of that more recent retelling is so inseparable from the history of the 20th and early 21st century. And also at this point from the economic framework used to tell these stories, like I heard recently that Disney has been in the habit of sending takedown notices to representations of the god Loki. Okay. <laughs> Random. Because because they decided it looked too much like their property. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. No, I mean, I guess, you know, that just, that, that sort of, that's something that, that's an idea that rolls around in my head a lot, I think, because just coming from the classics community, you know, I, I obviously have friends both in classics and in Egyptology who, you know, some people are like, oh, I'm, I'm all for the Egyptian stuff because, you know, we got these anthropomorphic gods and then, you know, you have these god statuettes, you know, these votive statues, but also just like when you hear them described um, a lot mm-hmm. of them are kind of like these gender bendery you know, they've got animals, they've got gender bending, they've got all these things that, you know, you can kind of just like put on them and you're like, yeah, that makes them cool and blah, 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 blah. Now, you know, looking back, that might just be like how we exoticize them, which, you know, isn't always good, but, you know, for better, or for worse, that's how we think of them. And so, you know, if I were to think of, you know, gender bendy gods, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, I'd probably look at Egypt. I wouldn't look at Greece. So it's interesting to me that you ended up choosing to write in the Greek lens rather than going for something maybe a little more obviously like just kind of like, oh yeah, let me just pick a gender bending Egyptian God, you know? Did you ever think about maybe going into either the Egyptian or the Mesopotamian realm or uh, was it always, no, 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 they've got their like differences and they're, you know, already. So let me, let me try deliberately to go somewhere, you know, where we haven't gone. Well, one of the things that I was thinking about as I was writing Wrath Goddess Sing was the Interpretatio Greca, the Greek synthesis where they sort of were like, well, as far as we can tell, Zeus and Canaanite Baal and Amun kind of do the same things. What if they're just the same person? Honestly, they're probably the same person. And that's a Ptolemaic interpretation, but it's an old interpretation that probably actually links to deeper time than that because while like the history of gods is kind of a fascinating thing because you simultaneously have these very like city bug city gods 
And very quickly, you also have these internationalizations of God. Sometimes literally like a statue is sent on a trip and then another statue is made in the destination. And then they're like, now she has two houses. So that's something I was thinking about a lot because Hera and Hathor not only were syncretized heavily, but they have a lot in common in their portfolio and in their mythological role. Like if you do a sort of structuralist analysis, they're both cow goddesses who have this kind of complex relationship with both motherhood and being the patron goddess of kings. So it was very easy for me to just think, well, okay, what if these are like really old entities who wandered around a lot and they're scary, powerful, and they're ancient. And maybe they pick up names as they go to different places. And maybe a new one walks in and people think it's this other god and it gets tangled and messed up because they're not going to be like, actually, you have a case of the mistaken identity. I'm not actually cow goddess. I'm actually owl goddess. So when I started thinking about it like that, there was just so much room for strangeness mm -hmm. for the mythologies to talk to each other, which I would argue is their natural state. Like mythologies usually do talk to each other and trying to neatly separate them is maybe something we shouldn't have done. I love that because now I, I think I've found like a third way that it's kind of revolutionary in, you know, in, in what you've done with it, because maybe it's because I'm coming right out of a very heavy, like, you know, modern political grad program where I'm thinking about, you know, all of that mm -hmm. stuff. But, you know, it's so interesting because in, in, how we've separated things and like artificially put barriers and we don't want to admit things talk to each other. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I just took a, like a nationalism final the other day. And one of those was like trying to relate and find connections between all of the different, you know, countries and civilizations. And so I, I've learned a great deal in the last three days about like common, you know, ethno symbolic um, connections and mythologies and it's so interesting because what you've done in your book then is by sort of bending them together and, and, and conceiving of them as pretty much like, yeah, they're different, but they're also like the same because look at how close these are, you know, then what really separates us as people, as countries, as humans, you know, when we, when we hear people say, no, you know, my, I come from this race of people and then we're different than everyone. And that's what makes, well, I guess if you're a nationalist, you'd say that's what makes, you know, them better for other people. That's just what makes them different. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because almost from that modern perspective, I'm like, whoa, but what you've done now is if you're literally merging together people's like national histories and these mythologies that they've created clearly to say that they're they're different it's a bit mind-blowing to think that no your work is like taking these national histories that they worked so hard to make different and you're saying no but we really are like kind of like one just slight differences of course but we're one I think that's that's incredible I mean oh chills chills at the very least, I think we're having one conversation, which granted we can divide into multiple conversations, but we still should acknowledge we're talking to each exactly, other. Exactly, exactly. No, it's fantastic. And so kind of with that, though, I wanted to ask, like, you know, as a, as a writer, you know, who are you most inspired by, you know, because uh, we do have a lot of great writers in so many different genres. Um, and I know, you know, I grew mm. up with, you know, a Rick Riordan who just decided he was going to, you know, kind of try to corner the market on that type of ancient world in literature. So, you know, who did you look up to kind of? That's an interesting question. I think I owe so much to so many different people in so many different ways. Kenneth Lee, this latter half of the 20th century, really from the 1970s to the 2000s, really fantasy and science fiction writer, who also wrote a really interesting novel about the French Revolution, which is not even remotely science fiction or fantasy, but is very strange. She wrote like 200 books. She's the kind of writer who really is a writer's writer because she's so weird. When I was much younger, her books were a lifeline. They're just, they were strange in ways that preserved freedom and hope in what was a pretty difficult situation to grow up in as a, like as a trans woman growing up in the early 2000s there was a lot to feel bad about. And something about the way Tanith Lee imagined life and the spells she created gave me the room to say, yes, but you're not going to die. You're going to get through this. 
So Tanith Lee, definitely. Um, and the Duana. Of course. Yeah, her her poems are so weird. And they're so weird in a way that definitely, like, you don't think, oh, you know, 2300s BCE, you think, what is this? There's like an entire poem about Inanna deciding that this mountain would not be allowed to disrespect her anymore and just blows it up. The mountain asks her father for permission to beat her up. And her father's like, well, yeah, if you can, you can. And then she's just like disrespectful mountain. I'm taking my mace and I'm just smashing the top off. It's completely insane. I love it. I guess in some ways in Hidawana, similarly, because so much of her poems are about sort of pulling the magic out of despair and saying, no, 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 no. The gods are here and they're on your side. Well, the only one that matters, the others will beat them up. And granted also, yes, it's propaganda for the Akkadian empire. Like also my father will save the world. You just have to let him do whatever he wants. Still, it's amazing. That's amazing. And I mean, I guess I, I don't really know how often authors get asked this. I can imagine a lot, but do you have like one favorite either myth or story or poem that you just always come back to or is it just all like there's so much that you couldn't possibly pick because it's all like amazing one of the things i keep coming back to is actually a particular spell from the pyramid of Unas. you know the cannibal hymn i've i've heard of it because i remember learning about it but also i was like young so please remind me it essentially stages the the king flying off into the sky and then eating the gods. Okay. Did not remember that one. (laughs) Yeah. It starts like the stars rain down, the sky darkens. And then it's just like, there are earthquakes, the doors of the horizon open. The king flies into the sky. He lands in the sky and he starts, he collects his allies and he starts butchering various gods he finds there from the small, tiny gods to the big old gods. And just putting them in his cook pots and eating them. And there's this like there's this concluding coda that's like, you know, he shatters at will. He feeds on all of them. He eats their entrails, even the ones who come with their bodies full of magic from the island of flame. I'm just like, wow. Who decided let's put a spell where the king eats the gods on the wall of this tomb forever so that the king can eat the gods all the time? I don't know. It's indelible. It's fascinating. And the opening of the inscription is literally because it's stars. It's literally just stars. That's fantastic. No, I love how some just stick in your mind more than others. And and it's funny because one of mine is, is really like something I wouldn't have expected when I was uh, in the middle of my college years. I studied abroad in Ireland for a whole summer and someone offered me the chance to take like an Irish mythology course. What was I going to say? No, of course I said yes. And so we were like uh, going through this class and I remember my TA or whoever it was, was just like, okay, here's, here's a wild one for you. And then she just introduced the entire myth as death by cheese. And I was like, wait, what? What are, what are we talking about here? I was like, this is bonkers. And I study like Greek mythology. So, you know, it's been since like the summer of 2017. So it's been a while. So if you are a lover of Irish mythology, forgive me. It's been a while. And I- no, I need to hear this. I need to hear this. Exactly. So, so basically it was like the standard myth of da- standard like princess. I think her name was like Princess Maeve. And she had these two suitors and one wanted to like kill the other suitor off or something like that. So he could, you know, take his prize. And he was like out in the woods. And then he sees like the rival from like across a clearing or something through some trees. And he doesn't have any weapons on him because he was like eating a picnic in a forest randomly, but he has a slingshot and there's no rocks or any you know, apparent reason, but what he takes is, um, some of his picnic. So he takes like a thing of cheese, puts it in the slingshot and like slings it at the rival. It hits him like perfectly somehow in the temple and he's dead. He's just, he's dead. Oh my God. So I was like, yes, what is this myth? Death by cheese. So I wrote like an entire essay that summer about death by cheese. And I think I called the, that's amazing. That's amazing. Okay. I I have a couple more that just just that dislodged yes. in my brain. Yes. Oh my God. In the Greek Alexander romance, which is wild. One of my favorite passages is the one where Alexander decides to impersonate his own herald and crash a party in Persepolis. So he dresses himself up as his own ambassador. He goes, he starts drinking 
he's introduced briefly to Darius. He starts drinking. There are these really fancy goblets. And every time he finishes a goblet, he just stuffs it in his robe. Finally, someone comes to Darius and is like, this guy is stealing your fancy goblets. And Darius is like, what's up with that, Mr. Macedonian ambassador? And Alexander looks at him and says, wait, these aren't, these aren't party favors? Whenever Alexander has a banquet, he just gives away the goblets. But if you're cheap, that's fine. Here, have your goblets back. So Alexander sneaks out a bit after that. And Darius is sleeping in his bedroom. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, there's a giant crash. This huge statue of Artaxerxes, which he admired for its artistic merit, has crashed through his ceiling. And he's like, oh no, this is a really bad omen. Like, wait a minute. That little twerp was Alexander. Then there's, there's one from the Persian Alexander romance. Um, and this is like medieval. So this is like from the 11th century. And it's wild because after being super unpopular for obvious reasons in Persia, during the classical period and beyond, Alexander kind of was rehabilitated. Alexander's reputation was rehabilitated after Islam because they were like, well, okay, but you know, he probably made life really bad for Zoroastrians, but like, what if that was because he was a really good proto-Muslim? So Muslim Alexander is essentially in the Persian Alexander romance is essentially going across Central Asia, just fighting battles, meeting women, converting their countries. Cause he's like, you know, what if you and I, we could get married and we could change your religion. Wouldn't that be hot? And it works really well until he gets to the kingdom of the fairies. The kingdom of the fairies is exactly what's on the tin. Like literally when he gets into the kingdom of the fairies, a bunch of flying fairies attack and Alexander has to create a magic circle to keep them out. Aristotle helps because Aristotle has, you know, powers. And so then the entire armies of the fairies appear. They're led by the queen of the fairies, Arakit. And she's just this colossal badass who just flies around beating up his troops. So he's like, okay, well, we're massively outnumbered. The first thing we've got to do is use the names of God to drive off as many fairies as possible. So all the pagan fairies are driven off instantly. But Arakit is a Muslim fairy and her core elite guard is too. So they're just like, well, we're believers. You're still on our land and we're still going to kill you. But, you know, one thing leads to another. And eventually Alexander's like, or we could get married. At which point Aristotle is super upset. He starts a rumor that Arakid has scandalously hairy legs. <laughs> He's like, I'm sorry, but like all the guys are saying her legs are really hairy. And Alexander's like, I don't care. So then the rest of the Persian Alexander romance is the on again, off again relationship between Alexander and Arakid. It's, it's amazing. That is amazing. I love mythology. I love stories. I love I love it all. There's, there's not one aspect of it that I don't just love so much. Right. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Oh my goodness. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So obviously, as I was saying at the beginning, I, unfortunately, because of my final schedule and my papers could not actually read a bit of the book, you know, what can you tease about it? You know, we've just been talking about great stories now. So what can you tease about your own story that you've lovingly crafted? One thing I can say is don't underestimate Helen. Don't think you know who she is. And definitely don't, don't have this image in your mind that she's like delicate flower of idealized elite womanhood. The Helen as she has existed for the past 400 years or so is extremely coded around lack of complicity and blamelessness by people who maybe have a vested interest in portraying her in a particular way. The classical Greeks had a different view of Helen and had had for some time. Supposedly the reason Homer went blind is because Helen didn't like the way he wrote her and wanted a more flattering reading. There was another poet who was blinded after writing a satire of Helen, at which point he proceeded to write an entire story basically saying, oh, Helen was in Egypt the whole time. They were fighting over a projection of Helen. The real Helen was just chilling in the Delta, sipping drinks because, you know, that's what she did. But Helen is in the Iliad is such a fascinating figure because the first time we see her, she's wondering, where are my brothers? 
Shouldn't they be here? Why aren't they on the battlefield? Did they just not care? And then the narrator is like, dear reader, her brothers had died years before. Then she goes back to her rooms and she's making giant tapestries of Achaeans and Trojans fighting over her. And she's like, yeah, this is how I make my name. Love it. And that's weird. So my Helen is what you would expect if you had no expectations about Helen, but you did know that she might be sneaking up behind you with glowing golden eyes, grinning a little. The other thing I can tease is dolphins. Never trust dolphins. Yes. Never trust a dolphin. (laughs) So one of the things that happens, this is a spoiler, um, fairly early on, a certain Egyptian princess is like, I'm really into philology, she says. And I'm told dolphins communicate through squeaks and trills. So I really want to find a good translator so I can talk to some dolphins. And her friends say, what? You can't talk to dolphins. And she says, or maybe all the Achaeans around here are just bad at linguistics. Maybe I can talk to dolphins. But who knows what'll happen when you talk to dolphins? What will they say? What kind of messed up things do dolphins talk about? Science has given us some clues. Dolphins do name other dolphins in like secret conversations. And then months later, the dolphins who had that secret conversations will commit murder. They will kill that dolphin they were plotting about behind, behind their back. So dolphins do premeditated murder. Maybe we don't want to talk to them. Or, you know, swim with them because we don't, we, you know, in modern, modern days, we, we like to swim with dolphins or we have this idea that they would be fun to swim with. I've, I mean, I, I think, you know, we've all heard like, well, you know, if you get stranded or shipwrecked in the middle of the ocean, just look for the fun dolphins and they'll, they'll be nice. They'll like take you to shore. Dun, dun. They might. But it, it's very possible the reason they take you to shore is because they're like, you know what? You owe me. You owe me a favor. And I have to admit, ah, over there has been really getting on my nerves. Maybe I can get this hairless bipad to kill my enemies for me. I'm just saying dolphins have ulterior motives. Mm, okay. Well, if you want to know exactly what's going on with the dolphins, you should read the book. That's that's my only advice for you guys listening out there. Uh, read the book if you want to know what happens. From a, I guess, a different artistic perspective, I guess, you know, are there any particular representations of either specific characters like Helen or just mythology in general that you have particularly enjoyed when sort of brought to life in maybe a digital medium, like, you know, a movie, TV show, video game, you know, that you think are particularly well done or, you know, can we be doing a lot better? Because, I, you know, I, as much as I love the Brad Pitt Troy, it is so wrong that I end up wanting to, you know, like rip off my shoes and throw them at the screen. Oh my gosh. Brad Pitt's Troy. There has been an interesting string of animated mythology representations in the last few years. Blood of Zeus is terrible, but I was glad it existed because maybe we'll see more. Brad Pitt's Troy was so bad. I'm particularly annoyed with Brad Pitt's Troy actually for convincing a generation that the Achilles and Patroclus couldn't possibly be cousins because they used the cousin relationship as like a big flashing no homo when in fact ancient Greeks just didn't have a cousin taboo. Yeah. <laughs> like they are, they're, they're cousins in, in some versions of the story multiple ways. There's actually like Achilles is in some versions of the story, Achilles is Patroclus's uncle, but like through some weird complex, Achilles's sister is much older kind of way. Usually Achilles doesn't have a sister, but sometimes. And simultaneously first cousins once removed with Patroclus being older. So like, it's, it's, a, it's a complete mess, but alas, Troy, Troy poisoned the well by, by no homoing their cousin relationship. What do I really? did popularize the uh and they were roommates joke oh right <laughs> <laughs> which launched a thousand subreddits yes i'll just give a shout out to sappho and her friend <sighs> i love that account so much assassin's creed attempts so much and some of it is so cool like the most amazing way to experience worlds really plausibly reconstructed like 
love the classical Greece and Odyssey, love the Ptolemaic Egypt and origins. And the takes on the mythology are fascinating until you run into the frame narrative. And then you're like, oh, right. This is also half-baked science fiction. But some of it is so cool. Mm -hmm. I think probably the most interesting thing about like that I ran into in an Assassin's Creed game was the levels in Origins where you go to Thebes, modern Luxor, and then you can find your way into various tombs and you end up in related afterlives. Like you go into Akhenaten's tomb, which was definitely at, when he was alive was pronounced like Akhenyati. But you go into Akhenaten's tomb and suddenly you're in this Atenist utopia and that's really cool mm -hmm. i did love the perpetual sun the way that the entire world was just like dominated by the sun ball right oh my god <laughs> i really liked the ridiculous ramesses is the second one the heb said because it's just like this i guess giant like kadesh doesn't look like that but still <laughs> not a realistic representation of Syria, but it is a realistic representation of the poem. Of the yeah, yeah, exactly. It is. <laughs> I mean, I, all their, all their uh, afterlife realms are so interesting. I mean, I think my favorite though was portrayal of Putt as this like giant, muscly, badass dude. And I'm like, oh, right they had to do that because if they portrayed him as like this like 13 year old club-footed kid it immediately takes away any kind of like boss you know i know right <laughs> oh my gosh oh i actually really like the field of reads level i think that's the Nefka yeah the one. i did too it was gorgeous oh and the visuals too really it's just so gorgeous visually to look at and you're like like why isn't mm -hmm. it real why can't i go there I know. I'm going to go to the Field of Reeds. That would be such a fun field trip, wouldn't it? Like, what, what would a field trip to the Field of Reeds look like? I'm imagining, like, a magic treehouse type of thing. I don't know about you, but I, I grew up, like, with the oh, magic yeah. treehouse books just being like, oh, wait, and they got in a treehouse and legitimately just, like, ended up in the past? I would have to bring suitable offerings, which I would put way too much thought into. You don't want to be rude. I'm like, yeah, I don't even know what I would bring. Like, would you bring your cell phone? Like, you could take pictures, but then you couldn't charge it. You can't charge it. You can't get a reception. And you might get weird looks from the gods. Also, there's so much water. Like, mm. they're all pulling around on boats in the field of reeds. What if you accidentally drop your phone in the water? If, if, it's, if it's an iPhone, it's, like, waterproof up to a certain depth. So, so maybe... If you're lucky, you just like go in and get it before it like sinks too far. And then you're like, you just like wipe it off. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this reminds me. I was on a hot air balloon um, at Luxor with one of my really close friends. And we were getting to, you know, see the Theban necropolis from the sky. And she was leaning over the side of the hot air balloon with her phone. And I just the entire time it was terrified she was going to drop her phone like 2000 feet what would happen yeah I no i would get really nervous well i mean i was in in egypt with a good friend of mine and uh we took a nile cruise and he leaned so far over the boat trying to get pictures and i was like what oh if we just God. went whoop, right down and into the nile i was like and the nile's like dirty and gross and you really don't want to go swimming in it yeah um, yeah you know yeah not a great swimming place <laughs> exactly I know I got like lunch next to it. And then I just kept thinking to myself, this is like the ancient river that gave the Egyptians life. And it just like filled their, their soil and then just like made all the shit grow. And then I was just like, yeah, but it's like disgusting now. How did it, ew, gross. What do we do to this poor thing? Yeah, I thought about that a lot. Like um, I ran into asking about um, like where all the scarabs went. And someone else just offhandedly was like, well, you know, their population hasn't really recovered since the military decided that they were too scary for tourists. Apparently, the mummy. People saw the scarabs in the mummy and were like, okay, we're terrified of actual scarabs, which do not do that. Okay. <laughs> and so to protect tourists from terror, there had to be like a culling of the scarabs. Mm. Oh, that's too bad. That's too bad. So... 
okay, we, we have a pretty good selection of things that we've enjoyed. And now to the more fun sort of imaginative area of, you know, out of the things that haven't been done or that you would like to see represented, brought to life, either screen or video game play, anything. Is there like a, a myth or two that you would like to see or a story or, or even if it's been done a thousand times, is like there maybe just like a new angle you'd like to see of something that's already been done? Now we get into the stuff I'm secretly working on kind of thing. Ooh. I am so interested in seeing a lot more done with ancient Mesopotamian mythology because it's so influential and so many of the ideas present are ideas that we are still living with the descendants of today. And yet outside of Assyriology, like who pays attention to Mesopotamian mythology? People hear about Gilgamesh, but like Gilgamesh is boring as hell if you don't have the cultural context you need to actually like have a representation that fills in the, the gaps so that you know what's you know what's missing or else the text becomes really hard to follow unless you're unless you have a background in Assyriology. Fair. Like I'm obsessed with the descent of Inanna. I was talking to my good friend the other day and she's an Assyriologist and we were talking about why it, like like how unfair it was that we could get all these cool things in like Assassin's Creed would not get a Humbaba and I was like I want to see Humbaba and she was like yeah but the problem is like no one would know what Humbaba is unless you like looked it up or had a background and so she was just like it's not popular enough to do uh, you really have to have like I don't know something set in Akkadian era Ur or something to really like then you could fill in the details and then you could have like legendary monsters from the past mm. i would love to see something that really engages with anadwana and with the weirdness of anadwana on her own terms because like she spends a huge chunk of her long poems just talking about how cool it is that you can transition mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is kind of a not what people think of when they think of mesopotamia which Maybe it's a huge mistake. And then in the Descent of Inanna, like you've got the secret solution to her strife is to have a couple of flying trans women descend to the underworld and just be like, hey, Ereskigal, you have a tummy ache, don't you? <laughs> yes, I do. I feel terrible. Let's sit with you and talk it out. <laughs> Which is just like not the structure of mythology that gets popularized or Hollywoodized. Mm. True. That would be super entertaining. I, I, yeah, I would, I would love to see that done. And finally, I mean, now that you're kind of, you yourself have, you know, dipped into the waters of classics, you know, and you're bringing us, you know, uh, you know, as I think, as we've, as we've seen like a revolutionary story in, in more ways than one, I think in the past year, especially, you know, I kind of lurk on classics, Twitter and some of these other spaces and the, like the field is not doing a great job at being the most open and welcoming to, you know, minority communities. And especially, and, and it's really been sad to see trans voices have had a really hard time kind of breaking through. So like, are there any other stories that we could, we would like to see taken in that direction to try to normalize it and make it people more aware that like, it's, you know, the ancients didn't think of themselves in such strict terms. So like, why is it that we do now? Like, you know, I don't really know what the answer is, but it's just like, you know, how do we make it more of an accepting place? Like if we want to bring these ideas back, but like do it now. Well, I think a lot of it is just classicists maybe need to be better classicists because like Greek mythology is full of transmasculine stories. Like you could easily read Tiresias that way, but even if you don't, there's Iphis, there's Kyneos, who basically is sexually assaulted by Poseidon, who then feels bad about it and is like, do you want a present? Kyneos is like, yeah, turn me into a totally badass dude. And Poseidon's like, okay, done. You'll be the toughest hero around. There's a ton of transmasculine stories like that. Transfeminine stories are less prevalent and also more buried. Like the Salmachis Hermaphroditos story, it's very easily... There are so many trans readings available there. The one I'm personally partial to is, why won't people call me Salmakis? <laughs> it's not that hard. 
then there's uh, there's the famous, the name of the Cretan hunter who stumbles upon Artemis and then is like, oops, sorry, my bad, I'm leaving. And Artemis is like, wait, hold on. You're not a man at all, are you? We can shape shift you and then proceeds to. But like, there's a lot of pretty trans mythology. It's just sort of, most people don't run into it because mythology is a big place. And if you're not looking for it, or if you'd prefer to have this image of like this pure Hellenistic culture that has no room for modern weaknesses or whatever, you've committed yourself to any historical point of view and you're not really looking at the texts anymore. But yeah, I think that as long as people actually look at the texts, there's so much there. Yeah, yeah. I'm always interested to know, you know, how can we do better as a community, you know, how, what, what can we do to get our shit together to become a more, you know, welcoming and, and, and open place? Cause it's. Curiosity. I think, I think curiosity is key. Like it's so easy to bring fear and then it's so easy to use fear to justify maintaining power dynamics that let you have the power to destroy whatever makes you feel afraid. But curiosity is a wonderful antidote to that. There are mythology stories that have been suppressed what that's so cool yeah just fanning the curiosity is actually probably the biggest thing because none of us are born knowing the answers to everything as much as we may feel like we need to have known the answers to everything and I think just asking questions from a place of not fear without any particular commitment to preserving a power dynamic Mm -hmm. yeah yeah no and and actually I think it's it's interesting because you bring such a, a unique perspective because it's like you love classics and mythology the way that all of us do, but like not coming from like a purely classical or Egyptological or, you know, Assyriological a, a background. Would you say like being adjacent to our field? So like in it, but also like not in it, in it, like has that been like, what has that experience been like? Has it like, you know, I, I can't really imagine. I, there's no other way that I know. So I'm just, you know, I, I'm always so interested to hear about what people think as they're kind of like, they are here, they're, they're, they're part of the community, but they're on the periphery. Cause they're not like so weighed down by all the, the shit that, you know, someone might go through. So it's like, what has that been like? I think in a lot of ways, because there's no single home for me in the past, because like, give me a time machine and force me to go into the distant past, then I'll probably end up in Egypt just because I feel like I would have the best chance at a decent life. Even in the Iron Age, a fairly decent amount of rights, medicine, but still, I don't think it's possible for me to see any part of the past as my my home in an uncomplicated way. Yet I'm interested in these little flashes of light from all across the past. These moments, oh, here's Anadawana writing trans poetry in 2300 BCE. Oh, here's Apuleius kind of being insultingly pitying of Roman trans women. Except for that one that he's like, oh, but she's cute. I would do her. I'm progressive. And it's like, there's this, just this, like, just these glimmers of lives and of times and of places and of people that just draw me. And I think it makes my relationship to a bunch of different archaeological and textual disciplines very much one of questioning, but also so much interesting work is being done. Like, for instance, a huge thing that informed Raph got to sing was the incredibly generous tendency of a lot of women in archaeology to blog. There was someone who was doing interesting work in Hittite and Mycenaean women's pay scales. And one of the points she made was there's not a lot of evidence of unequal pay in Mycenaean society. Okay, cool. But it changes what you think of the past from this sort of received Victorian perspective that the past was like the precursor of Victorian society to seeing the past as these unexplored worlds that you just can learn so much about and then visions come. I have enormous respect for the people doing so much work in all of these fields. Like recently I found myself reading this entire thesis about Sobek Neferu. Ooh, what a great queen she was. She was super chill. Right. Right. And so mysterious because like, you can tell like she was a huge deal in her own time, 
heavily, heavily suppressed. Like, I don't know, it's, it's, I'm just so fascinated. It, as a fiction writer also, I can't help but think about what kinds of things fit into the spaces that we don't know. Mm-hmm. There's so much of a need to treat Hatshepsut as a prototype for all elite women in power instead of as an extremely weird person who's an extremely strange example. Mm -hmm. And so I really don't think you can, like you have to take someone like Sobukna and put her alongside someone like Hatshepsut to be like, oh yeah, 400 years are separating these people. They're in totally different worlds, reacting to totally different environments in totally different ways. There's no like trans historical essence that you can just slather on them both. But maybe by holding them up together, you can see how different they are. Yeah, for sure. And I love both of those women. (laughs) So I don't know, meandering answer, I know. No, no, I think it's fun. I mean, I think it's great. Um, There is no right answer, luckily. I enjoy hearing, you know, everyone's different, like, personal experience, you know, interacting with with the field. So, and, and, you know, I'm just endlessly curious by what inspires people to, you know, produce original work because, you know, it's so hard to produce original work. You know, I think it's all awesome. But um, at the end of each podcast, though, I have every guest read... Shelley's Ozymandias poem and after everything we've gone through I'm, I'm very excited to hear what you you know your, your thoughts are on this poem so yeah if you could just read it and then uh, you know what do you think of this poem you know cool I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stones stand in the desert Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Oh, I always like that one. It's like one of the standard reactions to ancient Egypt put beautifully. So at Luxor, one of the things that I found myself unable not to look at was these giant usurped enthroned statues of Amenhotep III, but labeled Ramesses II, of course. And along the base of the statues, you have these lines of kings in chains. And on the left, um, there's a line of kings from Sudan. And on the right, there's a line of kings from Palestine. And they're all, in that very specific ancient Egyptian way, they're highly racialized portrayals. Mm -hmm. And just seeing imperialism celebrated so nakedly. There's no, like, pretense of noblesse oblige. There's no, like, oh, we're going to civilize, blah, blah, blah. It's more like the statues are just sort of smugly saying, here we are, we rule the world and we're beautiful because we're powerful enough to crush you. And even after 3000 years, that's terrifying. It haunts me. I can't stop thinking about it. Just, I'm so fascinated. It's a really strong statement. I mean, we don't, I guess it depends on where you look, but like we kind of like do it still but we definitely try to hide it behind you know hide behind something else but yeah to see it so strikingly celebrated it's really an interesting thing to think about isn't it yeah it's incredibly haunting to just see like that power over others i look at like statue heads of amenhotep the third in particular and i'm just so fascinated because there's the intention to be portrayed as someone who literally cannot suffer as someone who is just effortlessly beautiful and beyond everything. This is someone who, by all accounts, had chronic pain so severe that, like, that was when Egypt started growing its own opium. (laughs) History, man. It's, uh, it's wild, and and the people reporting it oftentimes are more wild than the history they're reporting. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Ancient mass media just tell a random wild story and hope someone picks picks up on it. I mean, but you know, that's like Herodotus, right? Just everyone's like favorite crazy uncle just. Oh my gosh. I feel like Herodotus gets a bad rap. Like, I feel like the course of my life has been seeing so many things that Herodotus was slammed for as ridiculous start to be taken more seriously. Like he's like, no, no, no. The most impressive thing in Egypt isn't the pyramids. It's the labyrinth at Hawara. And like, maybe he wasn't wrong. 
just because New Kingdom sites were heavily cannibalized by the Ptolemies, the Middle Kingdom sites, doesn't mean that they weren't super impressive. Or just like random things he's, the random things he talks about when he's like talking about stuff that happens in Canaan. He's like, oh yeah, Scythians. And then it's like, archaeologically, probably true that there was a Scythian presence at Ascalon at this particular point in time. Huh, Herodotus checks out again. And so that's the weird thing to me. Like Herodotus goes out of his way to say, now I didn't see this personally. I heard this secondhand. Here's what I know. Here's what I could confirm. And he's constantly caveating. And yet he has this reputation as being like the father of lies. But I feel like that's not fair. No, I think he does get a bad rap. I mean, you know, you hold him up to someone like Thucydides and then people are like, okay, well, clearly one's a historian. One is like the crazy uncle who just, you know, tells these, these big windies, these big tales, you know, he's, you know, but you know, history is not always kind to people. True. I think we've seen. <laughs> but, very true. Very true. Oh my yeah. God. So I guess the way I see Ozymandias also, in addition to like, just a huge naked display of like freaking imperialism it's also a political statement by shelley himself right uh-huh. it's it's like a political statement on on the the fleeting nature the ephemeral nature of like political power the fact that you know you could be amazingly powerful and then you know realistically and he thought his civilization would be around forever and like a thousand years later it was like buried under sand and you're like oh how terrible <laughs> but like so valid um, and the only reason we know about his civilization is because of you know m- modern day archaeologists who've dug it up but also the people who like actually built his empire for him like you know we wouldn't know he was a king unless the artisan he literally was like yo make my statue make me <laughs> exactly like and make me the you know conqueror of the world you know make me look like the supreme conqueror of everyone and so the last question i really love asking people is if you think about ozymandias in that sort of political way do we have like a modern ozymandias right now like is there something that we think is like the most amazing wonderful just best thing ever that realistically usually i would say in like a thousand years but like let's be honest global warming might just kill us all in 200 years so i'm gonna be a little less generous but like yeah in you know a couple 200 years you know is there something we're gonna look at and be like what were we thinking because like why well the obvious easy answer would be like our fossil fuel infrastructure (laughs) i think this current age of billionaires is going to leave an absurd number of artifacts that if there are humans in a thousand years, they'll just be looking at them and they'll just be like, who was this Bezos? Was Bezos some kind of God? And if so, what did people ask him for? Apparently everything. Did he deliver? Well, no, obviously he destroyed the world. What's a Musk? What was Twitter? What was Twitter? We have lots of pictures of the Musk, but we don't know what it did. That, I guess that would be the easy answer. Um, I mean, it's valid though. Mm. I mean, how funny would it be, though, if like in a thousand years, all someone dug up of Bezos and Musk was like their penis shaped spaceship, you know, and then they were like, were we worshiping like sending penises up into space? Like, what is this? I feel like it's going to be archaeologists are going to be looking at a ton of memes and they're just going to be like, well, if you can decipher the memes, you'll understand. Oh, man. Yes, but what does this meme mean? Well, as it happens, we do have ancient textbooks in meme studies, which incidentally, there are some good textbooks for meme studies. Nice. Yeah, I don't know. It's, I feel like our Ozymandias's will be most visible if we just think about the physical geography and not the internet. Yeah. Then I guess cars are going to really confuse people. They're going to see so many cars. Just be like, what are these strange rusted out hulks? Who were they for? Were they votive? A car is a votive offering. I love it. I love it. Yeah, an expensive votive offering to the god of fire. (laughs) That's great, though. I mean, because we did find, we do find carriages and chariots in the ancient world. So (gasps) cars are our, like, votive offerings. So, like, but don't people need to be buried, like, near their Maserati Because otherwise, if you just like find one randomly on the street, you're like, well, was this an offering for like safe passage? Do you get passage to the underworld in your Maserati if you're buried with it versus like you're buried with like a, like near a Jetta or something? I hope so. Yeah. I think they're just going to be like, 
these strange cariform coffins clearly were intended to burst into flames, thus immolating the body inside. But for some reason, mostly they didn't actually complete using their funerary cars. So most of them did not, in fact, even inter themselves in their car, much less set it on fire. Very weird. We don't understand their religion yet. We're going to have to look at more Elon Musk. <laughs> oh, dear Lord. Okay, well, God's help the people who have to eventually sh- sift through that situation. I'm so glad that will not be me. They'll dig up this interview and they'll just be like, they're laughing at us. <laughs> exactly. Like, y'all, yeah, we could be laughing at someone's actual serious disciplinary study. Oops, maybe I shouldn't laugh. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. I'll laugh anyway. And and quickly be- before we go, um, you know, where can where can people find you? So I can be found uh, on Twitter and Instagram at Mayadeen Writer. My website is Mayadeen.com and Raf got a thing anywhere books are sold. Great. Oh, I'm so excited to read it this summer in between thesis writing. Oh, I highly recommend Oh, I'm that. so I'm so excited. I'm so stoked. And I'm so stoked I was able to get to speak with you today. I mean, thank you so much for joining me. Like it's been such a pleasure. Oh, absolutely. It's been a great time. Okay. I'm I'm very excited. And you know, congratulations again on, on the book. You know, I I hope people enjoy it. Me too. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. And uh Congratulations on almost being done with grad school. Oh, thank you. Oh, gosh. Fingers very crossed. Yeah, great things on the horizon for both of us, I really think. I feel like, you know, escaping grad school is so much more like, yeah, books get published all the time, but like grad school is its own special hell. In a way, but hey, come on. Not everyone gets to be an author. Like, that's a pretty big step. Well, thank you. Trireme Transit is now departing ancient office hours. Next stop is Present Ponderings.